Um, I'll, I'll leave it to Paul to uh, to introduce the panelists and, and describe to you how the day is going to go here. We've, we've got three panel conversations beyond that. I'll let Paul give you the highlights. Uh, I wouldn't do my job if I didn't tell you very quickly about CCOM. Uh, we got started roughly 45 years ago, almost 45 years ago. Next year will be our 45th anniversary year. Uh, and you know, we've done a lot of different work in this community over those 45 years. Um, we've had some major victories along the way that I hope accrue to all of us in terms of making this a truly livable community. <coughs> At this point, we're focused on four key areas. Uh, the first one, which you know, I won't bore you with details because we're going to talk about it for a couple hours here, is sustainable fisheries. Uh, I think that piqued your interest and got you in the door, so I'll, I'll leave that one aside for a moment. Uh, the next one is water quality, which obviously is related directly to sustainable fisheries. If you're going to pull fish out of the water, we need those estuaries, we need those hatcheries, we need those marshlands, we need to be doing the right things on the upland, and everything we do on the upland has an impact on the uh, quality of the water that's in Lake Montauk, that's offshore, the breeding grounds for these fish. So, you know, we need to draw the connections between you know, the sustainable fisheries part of this and the water quality part of it. Next project that we're working on in a major way for this year and next year is coastal policy. Hurricane Sandy came roaring through here two years ago. Uh, and we all took a moment and said, wow, what are the lessons of this storm? Where do we go from here? What would we do differently? I'm afraid we've lost a little bit of that momentum at the community level. Um, we're trying to really work with uh, officials from the federal level, the state level, the county level, and the town level to get us re-energized into a, a vigorous coastal planning process that hopefully gets us to a more sane place where we're making more rational decisions about what we build, where we build, why we build. Uh, and trying to build in that word that we keep hearing so much, resilience, into everything that we do in our community. The fourth area that I have to touch on briefly uh, is, you know, we, we take a strong stand against what we consider ill-conceived uh, development proposals that come into our community. So when you tie together water quality, when you're looking at sustainable fisheries, when you're looking at sensible coastal policy, you know, sometimes somebody comes walking in the door and says, you know, I want to build something really big in exactly the wrong place, and I think you should all be okay with it. <laughs> we're, we're the guys that stand up and say, I don't agree with that proposal, and here's why. Mm -hmm. And we try to make sound, rational, scientifically based arguments about water quality, about coastal policy, about sustainable fisheries when we do that. So hopefully I've tied all of those together for you, piqued your interest a little bit. We have uh, plenty of material in the other room when you're leaving. Feel free to ask me questions. Uh, you know, we've got stuff over there that you can take home with you. If you're not a member of CCOM, uh, but something like this got you in the door today, I would ask you to support our work because we can't do stuff like this without you being members. So I'm going to turn it over to Paul Greenberg and just say, if you have questions at the end, you know, please hit all of us. We're all here to try to share a community-based dialogue and figure out where the overlaps are on these issues so that we can identify some real solutions going forward. So with that, Paul, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, and, and concerned citizens of Montauk, not just for hosting this event, but for defending the kind of Montauk that I fell in love with as an eight-year-old. Um, I was a divorced kid, so um, I learned to fish with my dad. And um, the best present that my dad could offer me was a weekend in Montauk. And it took a lot of badgering and a lot of harassment to get out to Montauk. But once we were here, it was truly the land of adventure, the land of magic, and the land of truly great fish. So it's very, very dear to my heart. And I'm really glad that we can all hopefully have a part in really keeping Montauk Montauk. Um, a little bit just to sort of frame what we're going to talk about today. Um, so I live all the way downtown in Manhattan. Um, I live so far downtown that it's almost uptown. I mean, it's really, I live in basically near ground zero, and it was what's punch time called New Amsterdam. And um, I moved there for a girl, for the real estate. Um, but in the end, uh, when I started walking around the neighborhood, uh, I was kind of put off. It was 2005 when I moved down, and I found it to be kind of a glassy, cold, sterile place. It's now called the Financial District. And all there were were banks and brokerage houses, which if you're a writer and a fisherman, um, banks and brokerage houses don't really work very well with your life. So um, one day I kind of wandered down uh, east towards the East River very early in the morning, and I happened to stumble upon the Fulton Fish Market, 2005. And the Fulton full Fish Market was at that point uh, in full till. Um, there was all sorts of really interesting stuff going on there. And for the first time, I felt like maybe my industrialized, financialized, um, completely non-organic neighborhood might have something real to it. And I really loved the Fulton Fish Market. It was really some place that really seemed to breathe 
life and really kind of had the sense that reminded you that Manhattan was an island um, and that this city was once upon a time a fishing city. Um, of course, uh, a few months later, after I moved in, the Polish fish market closed. Um, and it got sent all the way up to the Bronx. And I remember I was talking with a fishmonger up there at the New Fulton Fish Market up in the Bronx. And I said, how do you feel about being up here in the Bronx? And he said, you know where they put us? Right here. Um, and, and it kind of got me thinking. And I started thinking about the position of fish and fisheries in general in, in, in the context of the larger American picture. Um, and that's when I kind of started getting acquainted with the fact that even though the United States um, controls more ocean than any country on Earth, something like 2.8 billion acres, more than 85% of the fish that Americans eat is imported, is coming to us from abroad. Um, I remember I was, I was, anybody here ever do business with Herb Slavin? Any hands in there? Um, so, you know, you, uh, over on this side. So, you know, Herb is a certain kind of very funny guy and, uh, you know, tough guy. And uh, I said to Herb, um, when I was up there at the Fulton Market, at the New Market, I said, um, I said, Herb, what do you think about the fact that more than 85% of our seafood is coming to us from abroad? And without missing a beat, he goes, who's the broad? <laughs> um, and, and, and I was like, what? And, and, and he's like, the lady, the, the, the lady with all the fish. Um, so I, I tried to kind of catch up with him. And then I realized he knew totally what I was talking about. He totally understood that the American seafood system has really radically changed um, over the last uh, 20 to 30 years. Um, to the point where, as I say, more than 85% of our seafood is coming to us from abroad. And I want to keep my comments short because I want to get to this great first panel. Um, but suffice to say, um, six, I would say, of the top ten most consumed species, the, the number, or I'd say five of the number of, of ten most consumed species, are coming to us primarily from abroad. And one of the most markedly noticeable things, and as I've been working with um, Carolyn Hall over there in the back, a historical marine ecologist, and um, Carolyn's been doing really interesting work where she's been analyzing menus from New York City um, over the past 150 years and looking at how the American seafood diet has changed over time. Many trends are apparent in those very interesting menus. Um, a lot of shad used to be on New York menus. But one of the biggest shifts that you will see, and the most notable, see, you know, it's hard to do historical marine ecology because you have to work with things like menus, with anecdotes. How do you establish a scientific trend from just wispy memories that aren't really in the, you know, in the data set? But one thing, it's a very, very, very clear signal that happens between, say, 1880 um, and about 1940 is the decline of oysters and the rise of shrimp. It used to be the average New Yorker ate 600 local New York City oysters per person per year. There used to be a variety of oysters in New York called a Gowanus. There was a Gowanus oh, oyster. I love Gowan. Now, of course, the Gowanus is a super fun site. Um, uh, so it's not, you know, what it was. Um, but there used to be several trillion oysters um, inhabiting the greater New York bite, and they turned the water column over probably every two or three weeks. It was an amazing uh, biodynamic system that we transformed from a food system into a waste disposal system. Why it's relevant here, I think, you know, we're all the way out in the end of Long Island at Montauk, and the possibility of Montauk becoming New York seems very slight. But I think we see the process. I mean, certainly, you'll, you certainly see lots of New York stores in East Hampton, but that's another story. But what, what you do see is a food system being transformed from a food system into a vacation system, uh, into something that's really for much more trivial things than feeding the country. So I'd like to invite the next panel up, uh, Bonnie Brady, Carl Satina, Mike Chris, and Dan Farnham. So we're going to segue into our next panel, our last panel, People, Planet, Profit, Creating Sustainable Fisheries. Oh, that's tough. Oh, my God. And there's more. What is this coming out? Local strike back. All right. So we're moving on to the next and final panel. Um, this is this panel is probably the most complex um, because we're going to really come at the question of the actual sustainability of wild fish populations um, here on the East End and on the East Coast in general um, from a few different perspectives. Um, all of these are you know, really great minds and people who have worked really closely uh, with the industry. Um, just going from my right to left, Carl Safina, who I think a lot of you know, director of the Safina Center, MacArthur Fellow, author of wonderful books like the Song for the Blue Ocean, um, most recently finishing a new book uh, called Beyond Words, yes, Beyond Words. Beyond Words, How Animals Think and Feel. 
Um, uh, and Carl, I would say, is a real thinker and a feeler, so it's great to have him on the panel here today. A uh, great fisherman as well. Um, we have um, Dan Farnham, who is a uh, commercial fisherman, fisherman. Of, all kinds, of all kinds, and but tile fishing these days, right? In my talk tile fishing. In my talk tile fishing. Um, Bonnie Brady, who is the director of the Long Island Commercial Fishermen's Association. And Mike Frisk, um, who is a professor at SOMAS at uh, Stony Brook. Um, and you also are a scientific advisor to the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Council. How do I phrase that exactly? Well, I serve on the Science and Statistical Committee. Right. OK, that's, that's what I mean. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> All right, so um, we'll have, each, as before, each uh, panelist about five minutes to talk, and then we'll open up for questions. So um, why don't we start, Mike, can we start with you? Sure. Well, first, I'd just like to thought, thank everyone for organizing this event. I think it's a great idea to support local fisheries and and the um, consumption of local fisheries. It just doesn't make sense, as a lot of people said, to move fish across the country and around the world to uh, feed people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just you have to be real close. Yeah, okay. Swallow the mic. Can you hear me any better? Yes. yes. Okay. So. I'm a fisheries ecologist and I conduct basic research. A lot of my research involves um, different areas across Long Island. And generally my research, research is looking at the ecology and productivity of local stocks, as well as the health of ecosystems. So I not only do individual species science, I also look at the health of ecosystems over time. Several of the species I work on are of interest here today and also in terms of the ecosystem, including um, I work on winter flounder, spiny dogfish, alewife, which, which is an azimuth fish that um, spawns in the ocean and lives in, uh, or spawns in freshwater and spends most of its life in the ocean. I also work on what was described earlier as uh, some trash fish, uh, various species of skate off the ocean at, in the coastal areas, as well as the endangered Atlantic sturgeon. So I work on a variety of species. I also work on several systems here on Long Island, most recently looking at long-term trends and the ecosystem health of the South Bay. The, the science that we conduct at Stony Brook and in my research group does feed into uh, management and feeds into management in terms of a lot of the data we collect and scientific observations we make do go up the chain into the management process and the assessment of species um, throughout the region. And as mentioned, I serve on the Science and Statistical Committee of the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Council, and we're responsible for evaluating the assessments that are produced by the government on, I think, 21, 20 or 21 species. And this is where really the science comes into the, uh, sort of the advice from science comes into play in the management. And I, I think we've made a lot of progress over the last few years. If you if you looked at the status of local stocks, you know, seven to ten or more years ago, you'd see that we had a lot of stocks that were under rebuilding plans and were being overfished. And presently, none of those uh, 20 or so species are overfished. In that's, in, that's in the Mid Atlantic. In correct. the Mid Atlantic. So the the 20 or so species that the Mid Atlantic Fisheries Council is responsible for. None of them um, are in overfish status, but a lot of the species that the council uh, works with include some of the ones, for instance, tilefish, summer flounder, and several others. So I think that's a real um, success that we can point to, and you know, a lot of people have heard really negative things about our fisheries, and a lot of them are true, but not all of them, so I think you have to see um, both sides of the issue. I did want to mention a couple issues that I think are of concern in the Long Island region. And one of them is, is winter flounder. That's a species that I work on. And we've seen in local systems that species reach really record lows. And actually recently we have a research paper that came out where we're documenting in some bays um, inbreeding occurring in the populations. And that's a pretty rare thing to happen in marine fish. So in some areas, winter flounder is, is in, in real trouble. Another, I think, uh, alarming thing we see. We've done some historical work on Great South Bay where we analyzed the system from about 1870 up to today using present data, and we've documented a pretty clear decline in, in the maturity of the system or the product productivity of the system. And what's alarming is the loss in productivity of that system is really the top of the food web. The large animals that are also the animals that humans generally like to consume. We've seen great reduction of species like shark, but we've also seen reduction 
a species like summer flounder and striped bass in terms of their utilization of the system. So over time, we're seeing these, those species that um, humans prefer not utilizing that system as much. So I think there's some concern there. Uh, presently, we're actually looking at, in Great South Bay, the impact of the breach that was caused by Hurricane Sandy and how that's gonna change uh, the community of fish. One other area I think that's interesting on Long Island, you know, historically before uh, dams were put in that blocked many of the tributaries to, syst to systems, we had healthier populations of anatomous fish, such as alewife and other species. And we're all, so one of the projects we're working on, my lab group is looking at um, a, a fish ladder that was put in on the Carmen's River a tributary to uh, Great South Bay, and whether or not that's gonna successfully help increase that population and increase the productivity of alewife. And which is a key forage species, I would imagine. It's, it's also a key for, a sport, uh, forage species. And the other thing I'll point out, there's also fish that we might not even think about on Long Island that also may utilize a fish ladder such as brook trout. We have sea run brook trout on Long Island, and they're at pretty small populations left from um, at least compared to historic levels that aren't able to make it to the uh, sea to do their sea run. And finally, I just wanted to comment that, you know, I think everyone here wants to see healthy populations and sustainable fisheries so we support both the fisheries as well as keep the health of the populations and there's a lot of tough decisions in that and you know it's true that um, heavily exploited species fishing is a, a primary driver of their dynamics but we don't live in a vacuum you know the the health of the estuaries and the ocean you know climate change and various changes to habit does have an impact on productivity so it's a, it's a complicated situation, and that's actually where I was going to stop. I'm used to presenting scientific meetings where we get cut off. <laughs> you're you're, you're at 534. So he, said, he asked for five minutes. <laughs> Next is Bonnie Brady. Okay, sure. Can you guys hear me okay? How's that? Close to the mic. Close to the mic. Better? Yep. It's going to be off the table. All right. Let's see. How's that? Better? Okay. Um, my name is Bonnie Brady. I'm from the Long Island Commercial Fishing Association. A lot of you all know me. I live in Montauk. I represent commercial fishermen at fishing ports throughout Long Island on all the different gear types that exist, whether you're a trawler, longliner, gillnetter, pop fisherman. Closer to my mouth. Okay, there we go. Um, if it's got fins, the chances are that I've had something to do with some of the plans. Um, Montauk is the state's largest commercial fishing port in the country. This year, as of 2013, we are 54th in the nation in terms of pounds of fish caught and the, uh, well, the dollar value. We uh, sold, put 14.8 million pounds of fish across the dock in Montauk for a total of $21.2 million. That's in 2013. Um, they haven't obviously got stats past that yet, but the important thing about commercial fishing dollars is the majority of it stays in the area in which it's caught, and there's an economic multiplier of between four and five. So that's between about 45 and 60 million dollars pumped into the economy locally. Um, we used to have a whole lot more of that infrastructure for the economy here in Montauk. I know, um, let's see, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but let's see. Start from the beginning as fast as I can, and I'll talk quickly. Um, Magnuson-Stevens Act was put into place in 1976. It was done to create an economic exclusive zone for America's fishermen because people were getting really tired of the foreign fleets coming over and taking our fish and leaving with it. Um, what happened as a result of that is they established eight regional management councils for federal fisheries, which they determined as being within three to 200 miles offshore. Um, and then they also have the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, which is responsible for fish that are caught between zero and three miles. In New York, we have two councils that we are beholden to, the New England Fishery Management Council, which deals with all the ground fish species, whiting, uh, monkfish, help me out there, Dan. It's a dual plan whiting. Dual plan and dogfish, and I'm sure I've forgotten somebody else in there. And then we have the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council, which has about 15 different species of fish. Groundfish, by the way, is 18 stocks of 13 species of fish that all of them swim in the same pond and are all caught simultaneously together. Um, I know I've heard some information, some folks have said about the fisheries have declined and we've stayed at the 90s mass. The reason it's happened is, and I thought your book, I've read your part where you talked about the imports. 
export. In the 80s, they started looking at fishery management plans and started determining which stocks of fish they believed to be overfished, and certain fish stocks were included in fishery management plans. And I have some copies of some of these fun plans. What they did is they basically decided as to how much fish could be caught and when. For a lot of the stocks in the Northeast, the nadir was about the early 1990s. Yeah, I've got a couple of them, actually. And then let's see, one, two, three. There we go. And then actually, let me give you these two. Just keep handing stuff out, and I think uh, these are good. These are good. There we go. Thank you. Um, and so what happened was is stocks that had never in the past, in the as in uh, Paul's book, he details, in the 76, it was the exclusive economic zone, American fishermen only from three to 200 miles. So then the US government came in and said, guess what gang, you want to go catch fish, we'll help you with zero interest loans and you can build it as big as you want. So there was definitely overcapacity that was created in the essence in the 1980s. As a result, in the 1990s, several fisheries experienced declines in their biomass. As a result, they were put on fishery management plans, which was what Magnuson created. It's basically the regulatory fishing bible for all fisheries that are caught in the U.S. The good news, well the bad news was in the 90s several stocks were placed on fish, well it depends on your perspective, fishery management plans existed which decreased quotas. It did not necessarily mean that there were less fish, it meant that the catch was limited to a certain level. So as a result, if there, some guy caught a thousand pounds of fish but he was only allowed to land 250 pounds, he came home with 250 and that was his catch for the day. It did not exactly exist to describe the actual status of the stocks, but Magnuson put into place two things and then was amended by the Standard Fisheries Act in 1998, which I think, well, 96, but it went in effect in 98, which created overfishing limits and an overfish stock status. Overfishing means that you are fishing at the level in which you cannot continue to replete the stock to what scientists determined, help me out if I get this wrong, maximum sustainable yield, which is a number that is created by the Science and Statistical Committee, which determines, it's a board of scientists that determines as to what level of fishing can occur. Every state has quotas. If you're a U.S. fisherman, basically you are the regulatory gold standard. You have quotas, you have essential fish habitat, you have habitat areas of particular concern. Every gear type is regulated by, and feel free to take a look at those books. What I've handed out, there are a couple of things. I've got the uh, Squid Mackerel Butterfish Amendment, which is about 300 pages long. That's just the, uh, I think, the environmental impact statement. You've got ground fish committee meetings. Those are taken, depending on the status of the stock, once every month, once every two months. Basically, all fish, fish that are caught in the U.S. are under a fishery management plan. There are quotas, times of year, seasons, depending on your gear type. If you're a trawler, it depends as to what kind of a net you use, how big the cod end is, which is catches the fish, what the size of the net is, the doors, how they're utilized. Well, ultimately, the goal is to buy American fish. Since 2003, we won a grant from uh, Department of Ag and Markets promoting locally landed seafood. That was 11 years ago. Basically, I'm kind of in the village idiot for about the last 11 years. If people want to know what they can do to help support the fishermen, the fish, and their communities, buying local fish is the way to do it. Whether you buy it from zero to three, or whether they go from three to 200 miles, ultimately, no matter what fishery it is, if it's caught in land in the U.S., that guarantees a level of quality that you will not be guaranteed if a Russian or Chinese boat catches it. No way, no how. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, that was pretty good, Bonnie. You need to give it <laughs> 10 minutes at least. You got me on the spot now. I'm, uh, I'm Dan Farnham, and I am a commercial fisherman. Although a lot of people in Montauk think I'm an accountant, but I'm not. <laughs> um, my wife and I own two commercial fishing boats. The one in Montauk is a 72-foot longliner. We, at this point in time, we target golden tile fish, and we also own a 95-foot stern trawler we keep in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about the longliner right now because we're in Montauk. I moved to Montauk in 1979 to go surfing, like everybody else did back in those days. <laughs> and my first winter out here, I realized I either had to be a carpenter or a fisherman. <laughs> and I ended up being a fisherman, which my parents hated, by the way. But anyway, um, moving forward, I worked on deck, worked my way up, 
eventually ran, running boats in the mid 80s and and having our first boat built in 1991. <clears throat> I just want to go back and, and just give everybody a little bit of insight into to how we think, how we fishermen are. Back in before there was any regulations, we, we, like Bonnie said, we gave the boot to the industrialized foreigners. They're outside 200 miles. Now we filled the gap. When I first started tile fishing, I worked with John Nolan and Dave Cruiser, who were the pioneers of it. And we double crew. We had we had two crews and two captains. We would turn like clockwork. A crew would be out for a week, come in, unload. The second crew was getting the boat ready to go back out. And we did that. And that's that's what fishermen do. We catch fish. That, I mean, that's not a bad thing. That's what we do. And we did that really well. And we still do it well. And as time went on, in the mid '80s. We, we realized, and the government realized, we all realized, well, these stocks of fish, can, they can't sustain that kind of pressure. I mean, we, we landed 800,000 pounds of tile fish one year, and, and it just wasn't sustainable. That was just my boat back then. So in, in the mid-80s, or the mid, in the mid-80s, we started getting regulations in a haphazard way, I might add. But, but when, they, when we did the tile fish regulations, and I was one of the advisors, we realized that we had to take 50% cut in, in what our landings were from what we had been doing on average. So we sat down and we developed a tiered, a tiered system in the tile fish plan where the boats with the bigger land with more history would get a, a bigger chunk and be, a, be separate from everybody else. There's three different tiers. And we, our ulterior plan, our, our motive was to separate ourselves from everybody else. And the four fishermen of Montauk, we sat down and we said, guys, we're going to take a 50% cut here. We're not going to be in business, right? So what we did, we went one step further. We developed our own individual quota system among the four of us. It wasn't legally binding. It was a handshake deal between the four fishermen of Montauk. And it was the best thing we could have done. I mean, we, but we could stagger our landings. Instead of having what's called a derby fishery, where, where when the, the, the way it used to be done by the government was, they just give a quota to the fishermen and say, have at it. And it's still like that now with squid and, and other species, yeah, where, where fishermen all run out there, the price is high when they leave the dock, but they all come in together and the price goes right down the drain. So we, um, we did that between the four of us, and it was the key to, to our, our are, you know, continuing in the fishery. Eventually, the government caught on, caught on, and they they developed their own individual quota plan also. So now it's actually a legally binding plan. You know, in a small fishery like that, it, it works well. There's very few players. Obviously, when you develop a plan like that, you do you run into the dilemma of who gets what. There's losers and there's winners. Um, our dragger is involved with a fishery now up in New England. It's in the whiting fishery. And there's still, there's still um, anybody in this room can get a permit. It's still one of the few wide open fisheries out there. We do have a trip limit. And we don't fill our annual quota. But every fishery is developed haphazardly when they do their plans. And that's, that's one of my big beefs with, with management at this point. Um, When, when, when the government develops plans like that, they, they, they take each, each time they sit down and develop a plan, where, where it's called limited entry, where, where they determine who's going to get a permit and who isn't going to get a permit. Well, every time they do it, they take a different timeline. Tile fish was 98, or 88 to 98. Ground fish was uh, 96 to 06. Monk fish is 2000 to 2005. Instead of just taking a 10 year timeline, and looking at everybody and saying, this is what you did in the last 10 years. This is what you're going to be doing, you should be doing in the future. So there's a little bit, bit of inequities there. If we get into the management conversation, I don't know if we are or not. But anyway, that's, uh, that's where I come from. Um, we've done it all with our boats. We've stored fish. We've dragged whiting monkfish. We've gill netted monkfish. We've done it all. Right now, we're down to tile fish with the one boat and whiting with the, uh, with the Mega Marine Indicator. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. 
1973, I was about to get my driver's license. And all my friends wanted to get their driver's license so they could take girls out on dates. But I wanted to get mine so I could drive to Montauk to come surf casting. That was all I dreamt about when I could get my wheels, go to this place that seemed like Mecca, this incredible place that I had only read about. And when I got here, it more than lived up to what I imagined it might be. It seemed incredibly exotic. It was so exciting. The place was really full of fish. And we would, uh, we would stay down on the beach for a few days at a time, sleeping in the van, fishing all night cooking fish that we caught, all that kind of really, really great stuff, and I really fell in love with the place. In the 1980s, about 10 years later, I got a boat that was better than I ever thought I could possibly get. It was an 18-foot privateer, which is a bay boat that's good in a bay on a nice day. <laughs> and we practically sank it with tuna. <laughs> because in those days, it never occurred to us that you ever needed to go more than 15 miles to catch tuna. And I can remember several times where we just looked at each other and said, well, that's enough. Let's just go home. One time, I set the anchor, and I looked at my watch, and it was 6 a.m., and uh, my friend's wife said, how far out should I let this line? So I said, I, how many arm lengths? 20 arm lengths or something like that. So I heard her say 19, 20, and then she went click on the reel, and then the reel started screaming. And two hours after that, we had nine tuna in the boat, and we went home and we had breakfast at the dock. So that's what it was like then. The first time I ever took my boat far enough offshore that I couldn't see land, we saw 30 white marlin that day. And I thought, wow, this is like an incredible wilderness, you know? But what I never realized that morning was we would never see 30 white marlin ever again because we, we just hit them at one point on an incredibly sharp decline that they were on. In the summers, a tuna, yellowfin tuna used to show up and it would be great for a few days by the mid 80s and then there'd be an airplane circling around in the sky and a few days later the purse same boats would come in they would basically catch essentially all the tuna the fishing would get terrible for the rest of the summer a couple of years after that there were japanese buyers all over the docks everything was a big gold rush everybody was going to make so much money selling their tuna and for a couple of years they did and then and we did too and then one day I was on my friend's boat. He was a commercial lobsterman. He was caught in that same, uh, that same die-off that ruined his living. Now he's a nurse. But um, we, had, we got into a big uh, argument over the price with one of the buyers. And my friend, who was the, he was the commercial fisherman, he came back to the boat shaking his head and he said, never again. And that was the last time I ever was involved in selling a fish. And after that, the sharks, we used to go shark fishing. We would stop when we saw shark fins swimming through the surface. That's how we knew where to stop. Then all the shark fins got sold to China. And we saw those go away also. So we came back inshore. And we saw that the striped bass were at an incredibly low point. The black sea bass were going away. The porgies were going away. The fluke were all going away. In the early 1990s, one of the best charter boat captains at the at the dock at Westlake where I keep my boat, still keep my boat now, he said, I have six Koreans today and they want to catch porgies. I don't even know where to go for porgies. Imagine that charter boat captain Monto didn't know where to go anymore to catch porgies. So it seemed to me, you know, I was very into using what was in the ocean, but it seemed to me it's okay to use what's in the ocean, but it's not okay to use it up. And soon after that, I found myself very involved I would, what I made my living doing in those days was studying seabirds. Um, fishing was a recreation that I, I, I loved, but it was recreation. And then I, I soon found myself in the middle of a career change where I got very involved in fisheries management. And I was on the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council, and Bonnie was explaining what that does. Basically, they make the fishing plans that everybody then has to live by, the binding legal documents. Uh, but in those days, somebody would come and say, 
you know, I think that the uh, I think that the sea bass fishery is in terrible shape. And somebody would say, you know, I don't think it's so bad. And then somebody else would say, I caught a lot of them the other day. And somebody else would say, but you know, it doesn't seem as good as when I was a kid. That was the level of discourse. And it <laughs> seemed to me that we need numbers. You need triggers. You need to say when it hits a certain level, then you have to change the management regime. You have to get it back to a fishing mortality rate that will rebuild the stock. You have to do what the scientists tell you uh, reflects the reality of what's going on. So for about four years, I got very involved in the campaign to create what became the Sustainable Fisheries Act of 1996. Um, and some of the ideas that I brought into, into that were uh, fishing uh, stock hits a certain level, it's defined as depleted. If it's depleted, then or overfished as it's actually called, then you have to change the level of fishing mortality. It goes on a list of overfish species. It, you cannot overfish it anymore. You must recover it, and you must recover it within 10 years, not within two working lifetimes. So, now that I'm really over my time, you know, no matter whether you love fish as wildlife as I do, or for fun or food as I do, or for a paycheck as some people do and I don't, <coughs> Oh, every interest is served by abundance, and nobody's interest is served by scarcity. And today, you know, everybody's enjoying the food, and everybody's talking about the economy but, and, the, and the amount of money that you can make. But when the fish declines, something else happens, and that is that everybody's heart breaks a little. And, uh, you know, our kids can go get whatever different kind of job. They don't have to be involved in these things. But we have to keep in mind that it's not about us, and it's not about now. Question from the floor. Mike. I need to get a question out. First, I want to say that this panel, you guys are the legends of the book I haven't read. Thank you for being there. <laughs> Your minds are, it's just awesome. I could, I could, uh, there'd be a thousand questions for you guys, so I'm going to get right to the dirt. My experience on commercial fishing boats, relative to the current last panel's discussion, where uh, chefs are looking for new things to play with, uh, looking to reduce waste, uh, looking to decrease pressure on certain fisheries and, and put minimal pressure but sustainable pressure on new fisheries. Doesn't it make sense to have the trawler fleet land everything they catch? Yeah. As opposed to let it go out a funnel into the ocean. That's that's a big yeah. issue. I, I get that one. That would be <laughs> really good for everybody. It's nice, thank you. I don't know those things. Um, first of all, I just want to say in the mid Atlantic all stocks of fish are completely rebuilt, sustainable, no overfishing occurring. Those little maps I threw around, you guys can take a look. So scup is actually, speaking of scup, is at 208% of its spawning stock biomass. Black sea bass, everybody's good to go. So in that respect, everything that is caught, at least in the mid-Atlantic, I think there's 240 stocks of fish that are sold commercially in the U.S. And of those, I believe, 8 out of 10 are, well, I have a note here, but I'll have to find it. 8 out of 10 are not overfished, and I believe 9 out of 10, excuse me, um, 4 out of 5 overfishing isn't occurring. It, you know, that's the way around, I can't find it. Um, it would be a great solution to be able to do exactly what you're saying, Mike. I think the key is to having quotas that are flexible because, I mean, for instance, with fluke, we are in New York suffering from, we're only allowed to catch 7% of the quota based upon statistics that were over 20 <coughs> years ago. We've been fighting forever on that point. Um, but taking discards and translating them into landings is the way to do so. I think if the quotas for the trawlers, depending on where you're at, if they were more realistic, then there wouldn't be as much discard. I mean, I think, true, the markets, I've got a list here of all the species that are caught in New York, and what you were talking about, trash fish. I mean, porgies, that's some of my most favorite eating, frankly, I love porgies. Um, yeah, Montauk, but Montauk Sea Breeze. Montauk Sh Sea Sean Breeze. Calls them. Uh, Sean may have gotten that name from someone. <laughs> but um, 
you know, it's a matter of people understanding what is fresh and what is local. The number one fish, even though it isn't, but it's eaten in the U.S., shrimp. From Vietnam, you covered it, from Thailand. You know, this stuff is processed in houses by Bur Burmese illegal immigrant women and children that are locked in buildings for 16 hours at a pop that make Apple look like a great company. If you want to buy shrimp, look for wild American shrimp. There's a website down in the Gulf. They fought a lawsuit against a dumping of trade by Vietnam and Thailand about 10 or 12 years ago. They won. You can get it. It's really important to know what's caught locally. All of the fish that are land in the U.S. are held to incredible regulations. But back to your couple, I'm sorry, I'll go spinning on that forever. Um, the problem is, is, as the ground fish scenario has boiled down to a catch share system, Instead of taking all the amount of fish you caught and cutting it into slices of the pie, and everyone gets a slice of the pie based upon what they caught, instead everyone got crumbs. And so no one was able to compete. And instead it became an economic tool to decrease capacity. And those that had done it for 20 years, whether they were day boats in Gloucester or mom and pop shops like the majority, in fact all of the fishermen in Montauk are, they got cut out of the pie. And the one with the most money is the one who won. And that includes a couple of trust scenarios that are further up north, going by the Cape Cod hookers, et cetera. And they, with the most quota, can then dictate who fishes and who doesn't. And the way the system works right now, it doesn't work. Dan's system, as we tried to push in Magnuson, when you have two-thirds of those that are in a fishery that wish to go to an ITQ system, which is an individual transferable quota, or to a catch share system, if everyone agrees, it could possibly be worked out and worked within that fishery to get a, a good solution. But as the system exists now, it would be great to do so. Dave would love to work, you know, 200 days a year and then be able to not work and hang out and do stuff. But right now we can't. Mike, can I clear? Yeah, I think that, that's a very good question and there, there's, there's a lot of issues that actually come up with that. And while the uh, 20 or so species, which includes some shellfish, that the Mid-Atlantic manages aren't overfished. Um, several species in New England region are overfished. And these and species, you know, occur over very wide ranges. I mean, spiny dogfish, for instance, um, migrates between Cape Hatteras and off of Canada every year. And, and winter flounder um, is a species also that it is not, not doing well, and that, that's managed in New England, but occurs, of course, down here in terms of the council. So if you started allowing um, all the catch, <coughs> all the catch that was landed to be harvested and not put back, you would have some problems, I think, with allocation. And I, you know, if you're fishing out of um, New Bedford and you're targeting a particular flatfish and it's been caught in bycatch everywhere else, so there's, you know, there's a lot of uh, management issues related to that that I think would have to be dealt with. But the other issue is there's also species um, in our region here, such as Atlantic sturgeon that are endangered species and they have to be put back. And, you know, so it's not a bad idea, but it's, it's a complicated, it would be a complicated <coughs> uh, solution. Uh, some people on the, yes, in the corner. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, I'm Arnold uh, Leo, as some of you know, uh, and I'm the uh, East Hampton Town designated representative of the town Fishery Advisory Committee, and also for almost 40 years I've been Secretary of the East Hampton Neighborhoods Association, so you know where I'm coming from. And uh, one of the speakers, I won't his name, indicated that the problem has been overfishing. That is, too much fishing pressure on species. But it's turning out that it's much more uh, complex than that. I mean, to name just some, um, the Scientists are now in agreement that it is not fishing pressure that keeps the weak fish population down, the weak flounder population down, uh, the river herring population down, and that it, it's much more of a complex uh, situation than that. And um, the uh, fisheries managers are to be sympathized with because, after all, management all depends on knowing how large stock of a particular species is, so the question is, that how do you count the fish in the sea? You know, that's not exactly an easy uh, job. And so it's all 
always a matter of guesswork. And then Bonnie was indicating where management is trying to go, and there are many in the management um, uh, commissions and councils who are trying to go toward flexibility so that um, it would be uh, easier to change the uh, quotas from year to year and that we would not be taking extreme steps of banning a whole year type at once or completely closing the fishery at once, but, uh, you know, uh, approach it um, more cautiously in the uh, management. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Um, Arnold, I think most of what you just said was kind of nonsense um, because the fact is that everybody knows that you can and we did catch too many fish of many species and when these management plans ended overfishing, they recovered. So all of the inshore stocks are no longer depleted. That's because of the management plans. And what you're advocating is to take us back to the flexibility of not really knowing what we're talking about. Because one person says, oh, I think it's bad, and somebody says, I don't think it's so bad. So why don't we just wait 20 more years to do it? Just like we had before we fixed it. But now it's fixed. And the United States has the best fisheries management in the world now. That wasn't true before. You know, I've been to the Philippines where in the fish markets they sell baskets of fish the size of potato chips. Or in Africa where people with a hook and line catch fish that big because that's what's left. But we have fisheries that people can make a living off of now, again, that are robust, that are really working. And they're out there. And I think that to cast aspersions on all of the uh, success and progress that we've made over the years is, is not very constructive. And in, in, you know, I used to be on panels like this 20 years ago where nobody would admit that there was even a problem. And it was like Gandhi said, you know, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. So now we're all here talking about how everything is recovered and how all of this has worked, because, because it does. Bonnie. And um, we have to wrap this up yeah. fairly soon to clear the room with yeah. Bonnie and Mike. I, I'm just going to say, uh, Arnold, I didn't necessarily take offense to what you were saying. I think you're, you're trying to say, perhaps, and I'm not trying to speak for you, but that it's not always overfishing that causes a depletion of the stock. I know, and maybe because I, you might, because you mind if I call you Mike, as opposed to Michael. Sure. Um, for example, Southern New England winter flounder is now overfished again, and the result of that apparently may have something to do with a gentleman by the name of uh, John Manderson, who works for University of Rutgers, and he's done some studies in which apparently they determined that the air temperature, here we go, let me see if I can find it, winter air temperatures of over southern New England actually show that lower winter air temperatures predict higher recruitment for winter flounder. So the reason why the stock has not continued to rebuild even though there hasn't been pressure. We were closed from 2010 uh, 10 to 2013, and so people really weren't trying to harness winter flounder at all. But even on top of that, it's only at about, what, 11% of its spawning stock biomass? And so the idea is to take other components and look at whether it's depletion, whether it's certain fisheries. I mean, we've got 1.3 billion pounds of dogfish out there. It is not overfished. Overfishing isn't occurring. If someone can find me a dogfish processor, talk to me after the thing. Because it is, dog, dogfish are apex predators. They eat everything and they pack up in thousands upon thousands of pounds. And they attack anything <coughs> they see. And it's a huge issue for fishermen that are fishing. It's part of the whole thing. It's eat or be eaten in the fish land. And it's also we're finding out temperatures, which I think uh, yeah, maybe Donald said. And then it's think we'll have to do the last yeah, comment and then we're gonna wrap it up. Right. Yeah, so I, I will not, I, now there's two things that I want to bring up. First, the, the, the impact of the environment on fish population is certainly significant. Significant. However, in reference to winter flounder that has been brought up, that's a species that was probably withstanding too high a harvest level for decades. And when you put a, a population in that kind of state, if you have an environmental change that's unfavorable, it's kind of the perfect storm. So I think now we're trying to incorporate into management that unknown 
that the environment does change, productivity does change, but you, you can't put fish on the brink and keep them there and expect them not to crash. It may be that they're gonna have trouble recovering because of environmental factors and predator prey relationships with other species, but I think a, a primary cause of the decline of, of winter flounder has been a long history of exploitation. And if you look at some historical numbers on Long Island, in our base, it was exploited quite high. And in terms of um, spiny dogfish, spiny dogfish is, is not overfished now. It was overfished um, a few years ago and it went through a rebuilding. And that's a species that, while it is abundant and a nuisance species for fisheries, it's also a species we've seen around the world get depleted because it's very long lived and matures at a very late age. And the fishery on spiny dogfish targeted the mature females and was able to reduce their numbers very quickly in about a decade or so. And that's what put it under a rebuilding program. And a species like that can take a very long time to rebuild. So while I don't disagree with the general um, statements, I think there's a lot of caution we have to have. We can't go back to the past, as Carl said, but we'll be in rebuilding programs over and over again. Uh, also huge role because I mean obviously there are many more houses on these bays and you know non-point source runoff I mean it's not just it, it may have been back in the 80s when things were really nilly and everybody was like go 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 microphone please oh sorry it may have been back in the 80s when everything was willy nilly but loss of habitat non-point source pollution destruction of eelgrass or whatever whatever it is that causes those I mean the island has changed dramatically, don't you feel? Whether the initial pressure that might have really put it in a problem area, according to some of the things, that, and I'm not trying to, you know, but what Fine. I've read is, it's, yeah. I, I fear that you've started a whole new conference. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Dan would like. I'm Dan, sorry. Dan, Dan, no, no, it's, it's, it's exactly the kind of conversation you want to spawn. But Dan, you wanted to wait. I, on I this. just wanted to say, we'll the majority <laughs> of the species of fish in this country that are deemed overfished right now are are. They're not, oh, the term overfishing is, 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 I don't like that term. Winter flounder, the biggest problem with winter flounder is in the environment. They spawn in the estuaries, in the bays, inshore. The same problem that, that affected the lobsters and the clams, like Mike said before. We're ne if we stop fishing right now, we will never get winter flounder back. And, and that's, that's one thing I wanted to say. The other thing was, just in response to Carl's comment, we as fishermen, we know we need regulation. There's no doubt about it. We're happy to have them. I mean, we're happy to have healthy stocks right now to work on. We've been through the 80s and the 70s. We know the difference. Well, what we do want is maybe a little bit of flexibility in the timeline. When a stock is considered overfished, to have it be mandated that it's got to be recovered in 10 years is a little, I mean, my, my career is what, 40 years long? These fish have been around for millions of years. Do you think it's going to, the official mind, if it's going to take another 10 years to recover or not? The regulations in place are, if it's going to recover, I mean, this, this country has the most, the better regulations for, to fisheries management than any other country in the world are close to it. And remember that when you buy fish, buy American and buy local. If you want to help us out, just. I just want to um, I just want to say something about the 10-year rebuilding timeline because actually that was my idea. And, and, and I'll tell you where it comes from because people think it's arbitrary. When, when I asked um, when I asked a bunch of the best fishery scientists that I knew, how fast do you think most of these fish could recover to the targets we're going to be setting? They said five years. So then I thought, well. Why don't we make it double that to give people more time? But as we saw with the way that tuna are managed internationally with plans that are 40 years, when it gets 20 years in and it's a disaster, they add another 20 years to it. So the idea was double the amount of time that the fish need to recover, but keep it short enough so that you really get a signal from it. So obviously, it, you know, a longer time is, is easier than a shorter time, but a shorter time is more effective, and that's just the thinking behind it. Talking about time frames. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're in a restaurant for crying out loud. Ten seconds. Ten seconds, I'm timing you. Tuna are highly migratory. They involve international treaties. Local stocks 
it doesn't matter if it's the idea of flexibility is to allow for both fishermen and the fish to coexist so that seconds. no one's life is ruined as a result of okay. it. At the same time, the fish continue to grow. Great. Okay. Lovely to have you all here. I would like a round of applause for the restaurant owners. Oh, yeah. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to the concerned citizens of Montauk. And really, at the end of the day, I think what we really have to do is thank Montauk. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. beautiful place. When I went on Divorce Dad Weekends, he always went to the Land Zen. And to me, this is the ultimate Land Zen, um, where the Land Zen and the wildness begins. So let's all just, you know, a big hug and a kiss tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>